Hey everyone, I'm Carlos and welcome to a new book discussion of productbooklab.com. Every month we discuss online a book about product management together with the author and other product colleagues. If you want to find the recordings from our previous discussions and also join us and participate on the upcoming ones, go to productbooklab.com. To find out how to support the book club and help us keep it running without any ads, check the links in the description. Welcome everyone. This is productbooklab.com. I am Carlos. And we meet here uh, once a month to discuss a book related to product management. This month we have, uh, we're going to discuss Empower, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products by Marty Kagan and Chris Jones. And we have uh, Marty here with us uh, in the call. Um, so yeah, thanks Marty. Uh, and yeah, maybe just for, for the new ones uh, joining, please uh, yeah, feel free to, to make questions, uh, comments, give feedback about the book uh, throughout the hour. Just make sure not to uh, interrupt someone else and to present yourself. But yeah, thanks again, Marty, for joining us. Uh, I, I think everyone might be very familiar with, with yourself, right? With the, with the blog, uh, with the book, of course. So maybe we can start uh, with you telling us a bit more of the, the motivation for writing this, your second book, right? We, we discussed Inspire before as well. But yeah, maybe we can start with that. Sure, sure. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And, and um, the, honestly, the motivation for Empowered was Inspired. When I published uh, the second edition of Inspired, it went, the first edition was mostly in the sort of Silicon Valley product community. And, but the second edition went all over. And one of the things that happened was that many people, especially people outside of the United States, but all over, even including in San Francisco, many people told me that they're, they wanted to work that way, but their management was not really okay with that. They really weren't supportive of them working that way. And this was really bizarre to me. I didn't understand uh, why, why any management really wouldn't want to work that way. All the most valuable companies in the world work that way. So just from profit or money alone, they, you'd think they would want to do that. But anyway, I started talking to some of these leaders many of them actually CEOs and saying, and asking them why, you know, why, what is it? Why do you want to work like the old way? Why, do, why don't you want to work like Amazon or Google or Stripe or Slack? Why not? And um, I learned that the teams, you know, sharing the best practices of the teams is important, but even more important is to share the best practices of how leadership is done. Because the vast majority of them never saw, they've never worked at a good product company. They have never seen good product leadership. So they really didn't know. Um, and the way they lead their companies is so different than the way good, good companies lead their companies. So I realized, well, all right, I, I had no intention of writing another book, but I realized there was a big problem. Nobody had really talked about product leadership at good product companies. And so um, that became a three year project, you know, to uh, oh. call it, it, These are hard things to write about. These are hard topics. If you've read Empowered, you know, it's a much more difficult topics than Inspired. Inspired is just fun topics to me. These are, these are really not that hard topics. They might be different to a lot of people new, but they're not that hard to explain. But leadership is harder strategy is harder, vision is harder. I mean, these are much building an organization is harder. And so um, it took us some real time to get that to the point where I felt like it, it did, could do the job. I had been doing coaching leadership for my whole career really as, uh, but that's one-on-one. -on -one. It's much easier to coach somebody one-on-one -on -one than to write a book about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, team topology is a super hard topic. Uh, objectives is a hard topic. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a harder read. And I try to tell people that haven't yet read Empowered that it's harder. These are these are more difficult topics. So you're gonna need to really, you know, take some more time to work through it. But but the good news is a lot of people have told me that 
they understand now. It's really kind of funny because the the I get two responses from most leaders after mm -hmm. they read the book. The first thing they tell me is that, okay, we were not doing any of this before. <laughs> so they realize <laughs> that they just were not doing this. And the second thing they say is, and, and this is hard. I mean, you know, where do you really learn this stuff? And of course, most of us that have learned it is learned it from our companies. Our bosses had been working this way, um, but many people don't have that advantage. And so that's why. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Very interesting. And, and like you said, right, I, I think Inspired is more targeted to the product teams themselves. And I remember also when we discussed them, right, a lot of the questions were, how do I make my uh, manager or like the, the CEO understand this? And then when, when Empower came out, I was like, okay, this is uh, the solution, right? Give them the book. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah, I, I, I muted everyone uh, by default when entering, just to avoid noises. But yeah, if everyone, anyone wants to uh, yeah, share any questions or comments, uh, please feel, feel free. Somebody sent a direct question to me. Um, uh, feel free to just when you send a question on the chat to send it to everybody or unless you truly want it to be private. But the question was about, you know, do I like to do, do I like to build products more? Or do I like to build organizations more? Um, and in, in truth, I still, my favorite thing is building products. My favorite thing is product discovery. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, I, I could do that all day. It's super fun. It's super interesting. Every single problem you work on is different. I love that. But I would also say that I feel like I've made a bigger impact by building leaders. Because, you know, for every leader that you help become a great leader, um, they are able to help 100 people, 200 people. It's a, it's a much, I think it's more impactful to help the leaders. And, and so I do spend a lot of time with CEOs and, and with heads of product and heads of technology. Those are kind of the three main roles I spend a lot of time with. But, um, but I, I, I like that. I will say it's, you know, this is sounding redundant, but it is harder because so much of that is a people issue. You know, it's not really about the product, it's about people. My partner, SVPG partner, Christian Idioti has this great quote, which is, uh, I think I put it in the book somewhere. I love the quote, which is every problem is a people problem. Yeah. And, you know, people problems are a lot more difficult than a product problem. We have all kinds of good techniques for product problems. But if you've got some toxic person in the organization, and they are destroying trust in teams, that's a that's a messy problem, and often doesn't really have a nice, elegant solution. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have one question from Ibrahim. Do you, do you want to make the question? Yes, you can unmute. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I had to say hello to one of the biggest names in product, Marty Kagan, and of course to all uh, people, all participants in this uh, meeting. I'm really honored uh, to have a voice in this. And here is my question uh, from Marty. Uh, well, I live in Iran and um, of course we don't have many people uh, that have a lot, a lot in, enough experience in product and uh, has been product leader before. Uh, so I learned a lot of my uh, knowledge in product from reading books and uh, listening to lectures uh, especially from you, Mr. Kagan. Uh, but uh, there is something that you put uh, a lot of emphasis on that a product manager should have a coach, uh, someone dedicated to him or her uh, to make him a better person, make him a better manager, product manager, of course. But I don't have someone like that. I, I cannot find someone like that in my country. Uh, and how can I become a better product manager? How can I find something instead of a, a dedicated, dedicated coach? Yeah, no, it's a totally fair question. In fact, I get that question all over the world because uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to already work in a good product company, there are usually lots of people starting with your boss who can do that. 
but right before the pandemic, one of my last trips was actually to Dubai. It was my first time in the region. And I realized Dubai, you know, UAE is not the same as Iran. I'm sure you have differences that you have. But it was my first time there. And I, ha I had a lot of companies telling me the same thing, a lot of people telling me the same thing. This was very new. Uh, there, I was brought to Dubai through the, one of the local venture capitalists. And it turns out they were a really good resource. They had several people on their, you know, as partners at the VC that were coaching and developing. And there were also some CEOs that they had recruited. So now there's a whole ecosystem in, uh, you know, in, in the United Arab, Arab Emirates. And that's what you love to see. I'd love to see that happen in Iran as well. There are probably, um, you know, I, I've never been to Iran, so I can't speak firsthand. I can tell you that I have worked in my career with several very impressive Iranians that have come to Silicon Valley, like from all over the world, and, uh, you know, and shared. And I don't know if some of them may return and share what they've learned, because that often happens in a lot of the world. But I, what I'm really trying to say is I'd encourage you to try to connect uh, if there are VCs, if there are entrepreneurs that have succeeded, if you can uh, get help from them. Plus, one of the great things, you know, I should say one of the benefits of the pandemic is, you know, you can do virtual sessions with anybody all over the world. And I have, I've actually missed the in-person very much. I don't want to mislead you. I miss sitting down with, with leaders. But the benefit is I've been doing more with people all over the globe than I've ever done in my life. Uh, so that's a good thing. And, and you can get, you can take courses from some of the best product people in the world. You know, you can develop your skills that way. And I would encourage you to take advantage of everything you can. Nice. Thank you, Mr. Kagan. Awesome. Maybe next, uh, Gordon, I think you also had a question. Hey, Marty. I'm going to talk to you like I know you because we met on Clubhouse and then I, I just listened to Melissa Perry's recent episode with you and uh, right. excited to connect today. You know, what I'm really stuck on right now, I, you know, I, I read Inspired and I, I listened to the Empowered Audio book and I'm, I'm trying to get into product, but some of the prescriptions that you have are around like, look, if you're in a company that's just not doing, you know, the bar is not high enough, you've got to find a way to get with like Amazon or Google. And, and recently you've kind of said, look, Facebook, not so much. I guess what I'm really curious about is like, does that mean that most people should try to sort of huddle under one of these massive companies that's getting it right versus like searching for these product led companies that might be hard to kind of discern as they build their career, like the implications of that are significant. So I just wanted you to shed some more light on that. Yeah, it's a totally fair question. First of all, we should separate because you brought up two very different things there. One is sort of the Facebook issue. Facebook is not like the others. I, I've been trying, I've been saying this for several years, actually. I think Facebook is evil and I hate the thought of anybody that I coach or help working there. And I have done my best to try to convince my friends that have worked there to leave and most of them have left. And I regret my time helping them. I mean, that's a totally different issue. I hope none of you uh, help oh, a company so like on? that. Did somebody say something? I didn't quite hear that, but <laughs> if somebody did, I missed that. So, so uh, anyway, that's a separate issue. And I'm not suggesting it. Facebook is the only evil company. I would never help a, a tobacco company. I would never help, you know, there, there's just a set of companies that is beyond debate. They're, they're, they're just clearly evil. A lot of, comp you know, no company is perfect. So there's a, you can debate most of them, but that's a separate issue. So let's pull Facebook out of the equation. You, you know, what you're referring to in general is if you're working with, at a company that is just, you know, the classic example would be a big bank or a big insurance company, the kinds of places that really it's very difficult for them to even want to uh, 
work like a good product company. They're just so entrenched, telcos or other examples, usually where they just have government protection and they don't need, feel the need to work like a good product company. So there are some where it's like, look, you just have to decide. And I always, I always recommend that the person before they give up on their company, they go to their leaders and say, how about we run an experiment? Let, just let our team work this way for a few months and see if it works. If it doesn't work, fine. But if it does, that would be great. And most companies are absolutely happy to do that kind of experiment. So before you give up on a company, I hope you try. Now, if you do give up on a company, there are lots of choices. Uh, Lots of times I will cite because people will say, you know, what are good product companies? And there's a Netflix and Spotify. And in the UK, you've got Trainline. And, and, and you know, there's uh, obviously the Amazons, Apples, Googles, Slack, Stripe. These are great product companies. And if you join any of these companies, you are very likely to end up with a very good manager who can help you reach your potential. So that's an advantage, even though I should say, even in the best company, you might get a terrible manager and then you'll hate it. So that happens, that can happen anywhere, but the odds are much better. However, I also say that there are thousands of good companies out there, many of which were founded by people that used to work in one of those other companies. Look at the thousands of people that have come out of Amazon, that have come out of Google, and they often will start a company. And so that's why you've got so many great companies today. I was so impressed, you know, the founders of Stripe, which is a company that's going to be one of those big names, in my opinion, they're doing so well. But they like when they started, they were like, well, you know, they had people from these companies, but they said, well, let's, we want a culture that has the best of Apple, the best of Amazon, the best of Google. And they put that together and defined a pretty impressive culture. And so it doesn't have to be one of those marquee names. Um, I often recommend a place like Google for people's first job when they have a choice. Um, you know, let's say they graduate from a very good program and they get lots of offers. I often recommend that because it's a good place to learn as it's a good place to have as your first job. Um, but boy, there is nothing like a startup for really learning product. Uh, and I've done both. I've done big companies and I've done startups and there's nothing like a startup. Um, so if you get a startup where well, at least one of the founders knows what they're doing, they come from a good product company and, and the VCs usually are looking for that also. So they, they, they want to invest in a company where at least one of the founders is a proven product person. So you just need to do your homework. LinkedIn is fabulous for this. Uh, you know, you can look at the hiring manager. You can look at the founders. You can see where they've worked. If they've worked at a good place, they've done several good products. You know, that's what you're looking for. So there are many companies today. And by the way, I should say they're all over the world today. There's great companies in China. There's great companies in India. There's great companies in Israel. Great ones are across Europe. Um, so it's not like you have to move to Seattle or San Francisco or New York. And maybe that was true, you know, 10 years ago, but not today. Thank you. So, uh, Cor, I think you also had a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hey, Marty. Hey, guys. Uh, nice to meet all of you. And uh, Marty, thanks for joining. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to, to product management. I have grew into the role like uh, about a year ago. and um, uh, my questions, I, I actually have two questions that closely relate and I think kind of relate to the question that was asked just now as well. Uh, the, the first kind of is I, I want to improve as a product manager. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough that I've been able to land the job so I can learn on the job. Uh, but I feel like the company I work in doesn't work uh, agile or empowered or uh, any of the nice theories that you read out there. Um, so my, my first question is, maybe how important is it to work in a company that follows these structures? Uh, like, can I still grow into a strong product manager who loves working according, these, according to these methodologies if I don't work in a company that follows them? And then the second kind of relates to that is um, we don't have strong product leaders in my company. We have a CIO and then 
I pretty much am the first line of product management that falls below the CIO. So based on your book, Empowered, I'm not trying to uh, draw up a, a vision of what product management or empowered product management should look like, pitch that to the CIO and see if we could move into that direction more. Um, but I, I don't have the, the knowledge and the skill to do that. The CIO, I feel like might not either and might not want to as much as I do. So do you have any advice in that scenario? How would I make that, that switch within my own company now? Yeah. And first of all, it's worth pointing out, because this has come up now a couple questions in a row, right? That it's not binary. It's not like there are perfect companies and there are terrible companies. Uh, it's a spectrum. And what you really have to decide is like, where is your company on that spectrum and where do they want to be? So the, the, the first thing I would suggest is, and I know this sounds self-serving, but I would give a copy of Empowered to your <laughs> CIO. And honestly, I would give it to your CEO, even more important. And just say, look, you know, I, I learned recently that the most valuable companies in the world, the ones at the top of the market cap, they're working very different than we are. And uh, maybe we should consider adopting some of those practices. Uh, I can tell you a lot of leaders have really resonated with that. That's been the biggest surprise for me with this new book is how many CEOs have reached out to me and said, oh my God, I discovered your book and that's how we want to run. You know, can you point me at other, you know, resources? So I would encourage you to try to do that. Now you'll have to decide at some point if they're not interested at all, is there any way for you to do any real work? Um, it, it really is a spectrum. I know I'm kind of building a reputation as uh, being very, uh, you know, sort of uh, vocally against processes like safe. Uh, if you didn't mention it, but in a company like, you know, you're describing there, if a company is using a process like safe, it's really hard for any product person to do any product work. And so uh, uh, that's where you kind of have to say, look, if the company, if they've already realized that safe is not going to help them get where they need to go, then good, you can help them get on a better track. But if they think that's what's right for them, I don't know how much you're going to be able to do there. Now, uh, like Sophia just made a comment uh, with a lot of companies have feature teams. That's the kind of thing where a feature team is not safe. That's a delivery team. Safe is way worse than feature teams. I have seen hundreds of organizations using feature teams convert, really upgrade their skills to be empowered product teams. That is, uh, and that's, the, that's sort of what you're looking for. That's why I say, it's not black and white. It's not binary. You have to kind of decide where your company really is and where it wants to be. And if it's a feature team company, you've got a very good chance. If you can get the right leaders on board, um, you got a very good chance of getting things going in a better direction. Thanks. So I think uh, Fidel, you also had a question. Okay, thank you, uh, Carlos. Well, the thing is, uh, in, my question was kind of similar for, for uh, that, the, like the last one, but anyways. So the first book was inspired, which was uh, the tools, the mindset, the framework that you need to, in order to become a good product manager. And the second one was, was empowered. I would say that the order is, so we need uh, to have uh, the leadership, you know, uh, working as empowered, the uh, book says, in order to, uh, so, so we product managers can uh, put these kind of tools or frameworks in place. My, my question is, what, uh, what, what is the way that we can, you know, that we can do this, we can put these kind of uh, tools in place when you, have, when you have your leadership that is not buying the, the way that you, you want to work. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I could I could buy a, a copy of uh, Empower that you said. But is, is there any other advice that you can you can say or you know like when your leader your 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 VP of product or your product lead is not buying the 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 way it should be? What is the advice on that? Uh, yeah. 
that makes yeah. my, my question. No, it's good. This is a little different question than the last couple. This is this is often referred to as the transformation topic. How do you convince a company to kind of move, say, from feature teams to product teams? And uh, this is a big topic. There's a lot of things. I mean, just sharing a book is one way. Usually, I'll tell you, usually it doesn't come from you. It's usually from the CEO down. The CEO believe, and it could be a number of reasons. The most common reason I see is the CEO gets scared. They get scared because they see competitors like Stripe and they say, oh, we really have to get our act together. We can't keep doing this old way. It's not working. Uh, so they get scared and then they come to you and say, we really need to up our game. Sometimes they'll bring in a new product leader. Sometimes they'll bring in a new technology leader. Uh, you know, who knows? But they're, and sometimes it's the board of directors that says to the CEO, either you lead this change or we will get someone that can. I have seen that happen. Uh, very, you know, a lot of fired CEOs out there because they're not willing to make the changes. So, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might do it. Then, then there's those that are just see that the, there is a large pot of gold for the companies that are able to do this. They make dramatic improvements to their market cap. And so they're like, they want that. <laughs> they want the wealth. So there, those are all kinds of reasons. Um, I will say this, because all of those things are probably outside of your control. But there is something that's inside of your control. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to do this no matter what, even if you end up going to another company in the future, it's still going to be valuable, which is there is no reason your particular, you and your product team can't raise the bar yourselves and in the hope of showing your company what you can do. Now, obviously, there's going to be limits there. You're not going to be able to take over the company or transform everything, but you can show them the benefits. Now, that, is, that requires product design and engineering to step up. It's usually not that hard to step up design and engineering. They usually have already trained for this, but I'm going to be honest. Uh, the hard one is for the product manager. Because being a product manager on a feature team really isn't even, shouldn't even have the same title as product manager on a product team. They are, the job is so different, is very different skill sets. And it's a much harder skill set to be a product manager on a product team. But what I'm suggesting is if you put the effort in to develop those skills, first of all, it's very likely that will be noticed at your company. They will, they'll be happy. The stakeholders will like it. Your boss will like it. The CEO will hopefully get to know you. This is good. <clears throat> but even if not, this is really good training for working at a great product company. So there's a lot you can do. And I have seen that work. And then they'll often, well, they often will try to promote that person so that they can spread that around. So uh, that's sort of the bottom up approach. You know, my favorite is kind of both top down and bottom up. But I encourage you to do it. Thank you. Oh, nice, a nice opportunity there. Yes. <laughs> so, Sebastian, maybe you want to make your question? Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this space. And uh, uh, very nice to uh, talk to you, Marty. It's, uh, it's really an honor. Uh, before diving into my question, I want to say I'm a super big fan. I give these things next to me <laughs> every cool. single day. And I think I read this and evangelize uh, what you propose uh, on a daily basis. Um, so anyways, let me jump to my question. Um, I'm very interested uh, in diving into more specifics about the process behind creating and implementing a product strategy. So I would love you know, to hear more about the process that you would teach on a one-on-one -on -one or um, maybe some extra nuggets that are not covered on the, on the book itself. So very happy to hear you well, talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and that product strategy is one of the most important topics. It's also one of the most complicated topics. Um, and it is something, it's true. There's a lot, 
it's a, it's a lot easier. One of those topics, a lot easier to talk about one-on-one -on -one because we can talk about how, you know, the hard part is, I mean, the hardest of the hard four hard parts in product strategy is insights. Hmm. That's really kind of the money stuff. That's where, you know, you, <laughs> you really make something happen. And of course, in a book where you're writing for people that could have any kind of product, it's pretty hard to, uh, you know, I don't know what the reader's going to be coming from. Are they doing a fitness device? Are they doing a financial service? Who knows? They're doing everything. But when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like I was talking to a company just last week, uh, their leaders about their product strategy, and they're working in the fitness device area, which is a very cool area, right? It's hardware, it's software, it's community. It's very cool area, game, game theory. It's got all kinds of great things. And then we could go in and say, well, let's talk about the insights that really matter for you. And because the, the, there's always lots of data in every company, there's a lot of data. The question is, what's the stuff that could really move the needle? And so that's a lot easier to do when we can talk about a specific situation. Um, and, you know, I don't, uh, other than uh, experience helps for sure, but um, but, you know, in a lot of the areas I work with, I don't have a lot of experience myself. I just more like know what to look for. And I'm counting on them having that domain experience to know what's really relevant. But, um, yeah, I don't want to make it sound easy. It's not. But it's also probably the single most important thing to get right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Nice. Uh, Heiko, I think. You raised the hand quite some time ago. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the slot here. And I'm pretty nervous to talk to you, Marty, one of the <laughs> product management heroes here. <laughs> uh, I just began my um, my journey as a product manager. And you mentioned t the telecommunication sector, and I'm working for a telecommunication sector. And you okay. said also it's not binary. Yeah. And I have to admit, we are looking forward to go uh, to to the empowered, uh, to be empowered, but still, I need advice here. Um, I, I, I'm. It's hard for me to convince my senior colleagues to work more empowered, and especially, for example, long-term engineers to join product discovery with me. And um, what would be the advice here from you? Should I try to change the company, or should I change the company? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Um, actually, that's a really good topic. We, we talked about some of that already, you know, where you can develop your skills. But um, one of the chapters in Empowered at the very end, because, you know, I was, I was fully aware that book covers a lot of topics. Uh, most books don't, you know, I don't, I don't like those books that are a whole big book and they just, I read it and I say, oh man, that could have been an article. <laughs> it just should have been an article. I like to throw a lot at people and, you know, you can go back to it. You can work your way through it. But the, I wanted at the end, I wanted to make sure that the most important points were really coming across. And so I wrote a chapter called the most important thing at the end, which if you remember, or if you've read it, it's, it talks about the role of an empowered engineer. Now, that I really do believe that is the most important thing. That's the you could there is so much difference between so many of these companies, but in every case I know of a truly successful product company, you at least have empowered engineers. And so this is very important. Now, Heiko, that doesn't mean that you need all your engineers to be interested in discovery. Uh, that, that's, that is true that good companies try to get most of their engineers, but they don't have all of them, even in the best. All you do need to make sure is that you have at least one engineer that cares enough of as much about what you build as much as how you build it. And if you don't have that one person, you're, you know, then this is a sign that you're probably not going to be able to make your company succeed, which is why one of the worst things a company can do is outsource their engineering. And, you know, this is not done in any good product company, but you, there are companies 
in the in the financial world in the telco world where they just hire a third party you know they hire a company in india or in china or wherever and and they say you build it all if in that model you're never going to get an empowered engineer you're never going to have that partner i have never seen it succeed i just haven't seen it succeed it's literally the mercenary model not the missionary model that's the kind of thing where Unless the CEO really decides to get religion, um, mm. then it probably does make sense to look at a different company. And the good news is there has never been a better time for our industry. You know, there is so much demand for product people. And one of the, you know, the truth is there's a lot of good companies um, that are hiring product people in places where there aren't companies for them to work, like Africa where you can get a great product person who can work remotely. So, yeah, I, I would, I'm not trying to encourage people to leave their jobs because uh, mm. that's a big step. And I would, you know, you'd really want to make sure you think through that. But, mm. um, but sometimes there's just no way to succeed at your company. Uh, so when they outsource their engineers, that's one of the things I look for is a big red flag. Another big red flag that fortunately you don't see very much, but it's, it's sometimes the case where the CEO does not allow product people to talk to customers. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen that before, that is just uh -huh. like, you might as well give up there. There's just, <laughs> yeah. So that's not going to happen. So uh, there are a few things like that that are just really bad. But for the most part, it's fixable. Thanks for your warm signals. <laughs> I, I, I will go through them. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Good. Nice. Uh, more question. I sort of lost now count who raised it first, but Andrea, I think you. Um, thanks so much. I'll get straight to the question. Uh, my name is Andrea Gagne. I'm a product owner, uh, excuse me, uh, a product manager now, or manager of product people in Chicago. Okay. Um, so I've been lucky and cursed to be part of the first wave of two sort of transformations towards your methodology. Both at companies, um, both of those transformations were occurring at smaller companies with 100 to 300 employees. And one of the things that I've observed through these, you know, this small sample size is that when empowered product teams start functioning, it shifts power dynamics within the company and it terrifies certain executives. And because they don't know how to manage through change and at pace, um, and when I refer to at pace, like uh, empowered product teams can respond quickly and change quickly. They start putting things out quickly and then everyone else gets squished. They don't know how to respond. And some people respond to advocating strongly for the status quo and pointing to the problems created by success as failures. And so my, what I wanna ask you is in your experience, what techniques do you recommend? Um, at the company I'm at now, there's a strong groundswell on the commercial side and on the technology side. Um, of people who are indoctrinated to these ideologies and want to bring them forward. What techniques do you recommend for coaching up to executives to help them overcome this fear so they don't respond regressively? Yeah, that's a, that's a really insightful question and it gets right to the heart of what makes transformations difficult. Um, you, you know, you heard me say earlier that uh, you can do certain amount from the team level to get better, but to really do everything, you kind of need support from the top. One of the things I've really seen in my career watching companies do these transformations is uh, unless the CEO is on board, it really is hard because of the point you're bringing up. The truth is changing to a product organization, product model, it impacts a lot more than product design and engineering. It impacts everything. It impacts HR, finance, sales, marketing, everything. And because of that, 
Uh, it's no surprise there's going to be some amount of them that especially those that have never worked in an environment like this, that are scared. And they to your you use the right words earlier where you talked about the power dynamics changing. That's what's going on. It's it's moving from them really being in control to them really being a partner. And not all of them are going to go with along with that willingly. And so that's where the CEO really needs to show like, look, we're doing this. So it's not really up for discussion. Uh, fairly recently, I had a, uh, a HR leader that was really upset by all these changes. And, um, and really, I, I, she wanted to talk to me directly. And so we had a Zoom call on this. And, you know, she she didn't understand why job curves had to change, job descriptions had to change, didn't understand how uh, the, the evaluation process needed to change. And I'm like, look, I'll explain this to you, but you need to understand something. If you don't, if you don't get this, my next call is to your CEO because you are literally blocking the progress of your company. And you know, I answer to your CEO and your CEO is gonna have to, no. Uh, and it is, it is real. And yeah, I mean, this was an HR person that had done things the same way forever and was not interested. And, you know, literally HR can des de destroy a company. It's crazy, mm -hmm. but it's true. The CFO can do that too, but that's a little more obvious. So, um, so yeah, it does require that senior leader. The other thing I was going to suggest to you, though, is and I think you are from your question, uh, be sensitive to this. There are some product people and product leaders that are just like, we don't care about the stakeholders. They leave them. They're either like, you're either on board or you're, we're going to leave you behind. And it's, uh, you know, what's really going on is the adoption curve, the change or technology adoption curve. Some people can take change a lot faster than others. Other ones need time. And so just be sensitive to this um, and make sure that uh, uh, you're doing everything you can to kind of help them. You, you still will need the support of the CEO, but, you know, be gentle. Maybe that's the way to put it. In fact, uh, the question was also talking about what, when we move fast and we get things out there and we iterate, especially if your company moves to something like continuous deployment, that really confuses people in marketing, people in sales, people in customer success. They're like, oh my God, you're changing it every day. We're used to a process where twice a year we retrain our people. And, and there are really good things you can do to help with that, but you really have to be sensitive to their issues there and not just sort of ignore them. That's a big topic for sure. Nice. Uh, maybe Sam, I think you also had a uh, hand raised for some time. Hey, Carlos. Uh, hi, hi, Marty. Um, so Sam, a product manager at a small, small startup in London. Um, it kind of builds on what, what Andrea was talking about, really. Um, it's, it's the people problem. Um, there is a bunch of resources, inspired, empowered, included now, that, that can really coach you through product frameworks and techniques. Um, but instilling them is the hard part, right? Understanding them and, and even using them yourself is, is not that difficult. Trying to convince other people, influence other people, become a change agent inside the company. Evangelize product, if you like, um, is, is the hard part. Um, is, there, is there kind of any resources or any advice that you could give to that? Yeah, I mean, that is the transformation topic in a nutshell. Um, and I want to be very clear, changing, you know, like you said, the techniques are not the hard part. It's the cultural change that's implied. Uh, I, I, I was able to watch, uh, it sounds like you're in the UK, and uh, I was able to watch this from beginning to end at Trainline. Do you know Trainline? They sell the train tickets. They've become, in my opinion, probably the best product organization in the UK. And they were just a few years ago, they were, <laughs> let's just say not the best. They were <laughs> like old everything. They had all IT, it was all outsourced, it was all obsolete. There was no product, you know, classic. And what happened was, what, ha what happened? Well, uh, 
um, private equity firm invested some real money because they thought with the right leadership, they could totally turn this around. And so the first thing they did is brought in a new CEO. Uh, and the first thing she did was brought in a head of product and a head of technology. Now, I didn't say replace because they didn't even really have that. You know, they had a CIO. They didn't have a head of technology. They didn't have a head of product. So she brought in two proven leaders. And she and so the three of them got to work. Uh, one thing that was interesting was that's an industry that no, you know, none, the rail industry is a complicated compliance industry. So one of the things they did is hire a lobbyist from the rail industry to teach them the domain constraints and was really a resource to the product teams. But anyway, they got to work. They both hired new people and they coached everybody and they raised the bar. And a few years later, they were last last year, they were the biggest IPO in the UK's history. And it's uh, that transformation was just night to day. And um, well, a lot of things went right. They had a leader that knew what to do. They had product and technology leaders that knew what to do. They brought in good people. They let them do good work. And uh, if you're in the UK or most of Europe now, they probably love their app for... Uh, it's just they totally reinvented their company. So that's what it's about. That's, that's what, you know, and now they're obviously worth many, many times more than they were before. So, yeah, it doesn't make it easier, but it is definitely something that can, that can happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Paula, you want to make your question? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I just was, I just uh, wonder about how to evangelize uh, the people, how to create the culture, how to work better to the right product. Uh, because for me, uh, developers and QAs, designers are not just uh, people who have to make their job, but also they, I want to feel them as a part of the solution that we are building. So sometimes it's difficult because sometimes they just want to code, they just want to make their job, but not go beyond and understand what are we doing and why. So uh, maybe understand uh, or give a, 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 an advice of how we can evangelize that, uh, the, the, yeah. the cover process. Uh, and yeah, and I know that discovery is your favorite part. So. Maybe some advices of that, uh, maybe some to, to, to take into account. Yeah, so, well, and I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Empowered yet, but that's what it's for. You just described the purpose of Empowered. And in fact, there is explicitly your question talked about, what do you do when say some of your engineers say they just want to code? What is the responsibility of the managers? What's the responsibility of the product managers? Because essentially what we're trying to do is get teams of missionaries, not teams of mercenaries. This is what you're speaking to. So uh, that's a very big topic. Obviously, it took more than 400 pages in that book uh, to talk about this. There's a lot of things you really need to do to provide them the context that they need. But uh, I mean, that's my best answer to that question is, uh, is I hope, you know, hope you read the book and I hope you get a lot of ideas on how to address that. Just remember, we talked about this in the earlier question too. Remember that you don't need every engineer, every QA person to be like, to care about all this. You don't need all of them to. We want it and you should try, but you don't need it. You're in trouble if you don't have at least one engineer on every product team that is fully vested in discovery as well as delivery. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Lisa, do you wanna make your question? Yes, thank you so much, Carlos. And uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, so I have recently joined an organization that is trying in earnest to transform. So this is a, in the transformation bucket of questions. My last organization, it was very much a bottom-up approach. Uh, it's sort of how I ended up in a leadership position where I was kicking butt as a product manager. And they said, great, let's bring this out to more teams. Um, and then it sort of stalled because we did not have leadership support. 
where I am now, they view this transformation as a strategic imperative. So culturally, like we are on the right track. They've got some of the right language, like outcomes over output. They're really focused on developing this enterprise strategy. I think my, our biggest, scariest impediment right now is that this change is happening almost exclusively like within IT. And I, I believe we have support of the CEO. Um, I don't know that she necessarily has the language yet to articulate the transformation, but it, any, anything, um, I guess what I'm asking if there's anything that, that uh, I can do to help break or scale that wall that lives between like business and IT. I understand how critical that is and I'm not sure where to start. Like as an example, I was consulting with some architects yesterday and they're like, well, we're not invited to the table. And I said, well, go find the table and sit on it and get yourself invited um, and get their attention. But uh, that's, that's, I think my biggest, uh, my biggest scariest impediment right now. Yeah. And um... It gives me a chance, you know, a lot of companies, they already think they're doing transformation stuff and they're, they, what they mean by that is they're moving to agile. Mm -hmm. And of course, most companies we moved 20 years ago, it's not, it's not about agile. And it, you just sort of, you know, if you just view it as IT, can you make a better IT organization? Sure. But that's not going to turn you into a product organization. Mm -hmm. These are, in fact, that very separation of product, uh, sorry, of business and IT is exactly what we're trying to blow up. Uh, and so <laughs> unless you can get to the level above your CIO, which is usually a CEO or a COO, unless you can get to that level above, it's like, you know, and it's not the CIO's fault. Right? I mean, they're like, they're trying to do what he or she can do in that person's organization, but it it's a, needs to be a level higher. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping you know, that I'm hoping a lot more of these CEOs will will read the book or, you know, there's a there's a lot of a lot of people talking about these things. Um, so the, one way or another, hopefully that CEO will understand that this is the CEO's most important imperative. Um, you know, part of what's going on is how the company views technology. If they view IT as a cost center, which almost mm -hmm. certainly that's what they do, um, you're not going to be able to do much. You know, you know how much companies care about reducing costs versus growing the business. So what they really want to do is view. They need to do. They need to start viewing the technology as a profit center, not a cost center. And that happens when you go to the other side, the known as the business, right? So we need to blow that up. And so I, I would encourage you to try to get these ideas in front of the CEO or whoever that senior leader is. I'm going to climb the wall instead of, <laughs> instead of smash it for now. Thank you, Marty. Okay, you bet. Good luck. Give the book to, to everyone. Uh, Adwan, maybe you, you're next. Sure, we'll be happy. Thank you. Um, I just started uh, working. Um, I'm a product manager in the last uh, 15 years in very like different uh, different companies, from startups and uh, kind of like big companies. Most of my career, I worked on uh, B2C. So the whole. Uh, uh, empowered the uh, team was pretty easy uh, the way I see it it was pretty easy to do and now for the first time I'm working in a b2b company and I feel like I'm getting like a lot of uh, pushbacks and uh, the pushbacks are always talking about but this is like we are a B2B company, it's a bit different. You can't really, there is your uh, client, there is the user, there is something in between, there is someone in between. So I understand that we have different users to speak to. I understand that we have different clients to speak to. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how do we take it and really use it in a B2B company? Is this, is there some kind of a, different method uh, to do it like uh, so whatever you can uh, uh, point at the issues I see now is uh, especially on the discovery phase 
when you have like the 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 big stones it's not that it's not that there is an issue no everything works pretty good but i would love it to be a bit more to have like more people around the table we have product we have uh, engineering uh, we have product design on the table but i would really love to see more from other areas of the business and to speak to the final user which can be a huge company a huge advertiser and not just like um, the end user that uh, i'm coming from the gaming at the beginning so a, a gamer that plays your game it's like a huge advertiser so how if you have any tips that could be great yeah i mean it's uh, it's kind of a complicated discussion just because um so there's really two topics here one is the differences between building consumer products and, and products for businesses uh and then the other is why is it that so many business software companies are so bad at product that's the thing to kind of keep in mind most b2b companies are terrible at product historically they've been terrible one of the reasons I love seeing so much disruption going on in the business space right now is because there are a few companies that are awesome at product that are just cleaning up. Look at uh, Stripe, look at Slack, uh, look at uh, Shopify. Look, I mean, these are, these are products that are disrupting B2B space and they're doing it by creating great products. And by the way, most of the techniques they use are consumer techniques. So it's not a bad, uh, it's, and I like that you're bringing the consumer perspective. Now, the bigger issue is why is it so many of these B2B companies are so bad? Mostly because the leaders of those companies are not product people, they're usually salespeople. Every example yeah. is he's talking as SMB, B2B. Kevin, I think you are not muted. Can... Somebody, I think maybe it was a comment. Or, I'm not yeah. sure, but I heard there is a difference between small business, medium, large enterprise, and most of the terrible stuff is enterprise. And if you notice, a lot of the small business stuff is great because you treat a small business product like a consumer product. We've known that for a long, long time. But there are some real differences for selling to enterprises, building products to enterprises. We have great techniques for those. Uh, Inspired tries to talk about those. Uh, probably the most popular chapter in Inspired for uh, B2B companies or enterprise companies is, I think it's 39, but it's the one, there's a very popular technique for large businesses. So. Absolutely, there are good techniques to do this. The bigger issue is, does the leader of the company want to be great, do great products? Do they understand what they need to do in order to do great products? If they don't, they'll probably be disrupted. And I'll, you may know that VCs are investing heavily into these consumer people building business products today. I'm happy to say that I'm in place that... Uh... It's coming straight from the top. We have an amazing C uh, CPO, so we are in a good place. We'll good. get there. Thank good you, luck. Marty. Thank right. you. Nice, awesome. I, I'm just conscious of the time. Maybe we can, uh, for the ones that have the book, we can take the, the picture now. So yeah, the ones that have it, if you can show it, and then I will uh, count, and then we can take the screenshot. So three, two, one. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mari, again, for joining us. I, I know there were still some, some pending questions. We tried to go to as, as many as possible. But yeah, thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining, for listening. We will update the recording so you can see it later on. And yeah, again, thanks, thanks uh, very much, uh, Martin. Well, thanks for inviting me. Good luck, everybody. Hey, everyone. I'm Carlos, and welcome to a new book discussion of productbooklab.com. Every month, we discuss online a book about product management together with the author and other product colleagues. If you want to find the recordings from our previous discussions and also join us and participate on the upcoming ones, go to productbooklab.com. To find out how to support the book club and help us keep it running without any ads, check the links in the description.